On every street, in every city, there's a nobody who dreams of being a somebody. He's a lonely, forgotten man, desperate to prove that he's alive. We're often told, especially as children as we grow up, that we need to find ourselves a career. As a person, you will dedicate most of your life and your time doing that job so you better like it. It's what will give you purpose. Be a lawyer, be a doctor, be a teacher, be a nurse, a firefighter. Find a job that will give you purpose. But what if you become a warehouse worker, a fast food cook, or a grocery store clerk? What if you become a taxi driver? It's not to say that you can't find purpose in these jobs. You totally can, and I'm not saying that these jobs are useless. They're not. However, what I am saying is that certain jobs to many people are absolutely alienating and lead to a sense of disorienting purposelessness. It's the case of Travis Bickle, a former U.S. Marine who finds himself a job as a taxi driver because he seemingly has nothing else to do, because he suffers from insomnia and because he feels lonely. The fact that a need for money isn't one of the reasons for why he's working indicates that he's not looking to survive, but he's looking for something to do. He's looking for a purpose. This man has nothing, and perhaps many people today might feel that way. Without any particular passions or interests, this man is lost. As he said himself, he doesn't know anything about movies nor about music. Music doesn't play in his cab, and the only films he watches is porn. He's not an idiot, however, and you can tell that from how he eloquently analyzes Betsy's situation. I think you're a lonely person. I drive by this place a lot, and I see you here. I see a lot of people around you, and I see all these phones and all this stuff on your desk, and it means nothing. And then when I came inside and I met you, I saw in your eyes and I saw the way you carried yourself that you're not a happy person. And I think you need something. And if you want to call it a friend, you can call it a friend. You're going to be my friend? Yeah. Bickle is profoundly troubled. He's unwell, lonely. He's clearly uncomfortable, but he can't seem to know why. Though he brilliantly analyzes Betsy's situation, he has no ability whatsoever to analyze his own. Something's off, something's wrong, but he can't put his finger on it, which is, to him, incredibly frustrating. When Charles Palantine, a senator running for president, asks Bickle what bothers him most in this country, Bickle answers. Well, I don't know. You know, I don't follow political issues that closely, sir. I don't know. Oh, well, there must be something. Well... Whatever it is, he should clean up this city here, because this city here is like an open sewer, you know? It's full of filth and scum. And sometimes I can hardly take it. Whatever ever becomes the president should just really clean it up. You know what I mean? Sometimes I go out and I smell it, I get headaches, it's so bad, you know? And they just like, they just never go away, you know? It's like, I think that the president should just clean up this whole mess here. He should just flush it right down the fucking toilet. This is the rambling of someone who's profoundly angry, who wants change but has no idea how to enact it. He's unable to successfully identify the issues that are leading to his discontent, which is best demonstrated by his vague manifestos. Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore, who would not let... Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore. A man who stood up against the scum, the cunts, the dogs, the filth, the shit. Here is someone who stood up. Here is... However, I believe we can identify Bickle's source of discontent, not in his manifestos, but in the anniversary card he writes to his parents and says, I'm sorry, again, I cannot send you my address like I promised to last year. But the sensitive nature of my work for the government demands utmost secrecy. I know you will understand. We are, all of us, and 
I am healthy and well and making lots of money. I have been going with a girl for several months, and I know you would be proud if you could see her. Her name is Betsy, but I can tell you no more than that. Hey, Gabby, you can't park here. Come on, come on, let's go, let's go, move it. I believe that his discontent isn't something or someone as he sometimes seems to believe, but a lack of something. First, he's lacking women. He is the classic incel. Bickle is lonely. Loneliness has followed me my whole life, everywhere. Bars and cars, sidewalks, stores, everywhere. There's no escape. I'm God's lonely man. However, I don't want to focus on this too much as it's been discussed at length. Bickle lacks affection, he lacks a romantic relationship with a woman and, being entitled, he blames Betsy and women in general for this lack since she refuses to talk to him after their failed date. There's a cop across the street. You like the rest of them. Look, I'm calling... The second lack, the one I'd like to focus on in this video, is a lack of purpose. In the letter to his parents, Bickle says that his job with the government is so important that he can't even tell them what it is. Bickle wants to do something important, he wants to do something purposeful, but he doesn't know how to achieve that. I don't even think he knows he lacks a sense of purpose. But how do you get purpose? If you're not into art, music, cinema, if you aren't into literature, into crafting, into a sport of any kind, if there's nothing that transcends you that's bigger than yourself, if there isn't a goal that you can work towards, dedicate your life to, which affirms you as a person, which confirms your individuality, then how do you find purpose? You can either become complacent about your sense of purposelessness, simply resign and accept it, or you can refuse it and revolt. Here are the two contrasting positions. Man. A man takes a job, you know? And that job, I mean, like that, you know, that becomes what he is. You know, like, uh, you know, you do a thing and that's what you want. I mean, like, I've been a, I've been a cabbie for 17 years, you know? 10 years at night. I still don't own my own cab, you know, why? Because I don't want to. I must be what I, what I want. You know, to be on the night shift, driving somebody else's cab. You understand? Uh, I mean, you, you, you become, you get a job, you, you become the job. I mean, like one guy lives in Brooklyn, one guy lives in Sutton Place, you get a lawyer, another guy's a doctor, another guy dies, another guy gets well, and, you know, people are born. I, I envy you, you. Go on, get laid. Get drunk, you know, you do anything. Because you got no choice anyway. I mean, we're all fucked. More or less, you know? Uh, I don't know. That's about the dumbest thing I ever heard. It's not Bertrand Russell, but what do you want? I'm a cabbie, you know? What do I know? Wizard embodies the man who gave up finding a purpose, who's just living a purposeless life and got complacent about it. He's trying to justify how things are, why he's feeling that way, why Bickle feels that way, but he's not convincing anyone. Not Bickle, not the audience, not even himself. Wizard resigned, he got in the habit of doing the job. He doesn't feel the lack of purpose because he lost all need for purpose. He doesn't believe in purpose anymore. However, a lot of his speech, the fact that you get a job and you become the job, is not that far from the truth. In a way, we are defined by what we do, how we spend our time and energy. The fact that we become our job is not necessarily a bad thing. Work defines a large part of our interaction with our community, so it does make sense that it would define us in a way. This only becomes a problem when our job is alienating. Marx laid out the purposefulness of work in four points. 1. I objectify my individuality through production. When I produce something, it's an individual manifestation of my life. When the product is created, it's direct evidence that my personality is objective. 
This affirms my individuality. 2. Through this objectification of my individuality, I have the enjoyment of knowing that it created an object corresponding to the need of another person's essential nature. Your individuality made someone else happy. 3. Because of that, I become the mediator between you and the species, meaning that because my individuality answered your need, I become, in a way, essential to you, or at least to your growth. I become singularly important to you. 4. In the individual expression of my life, I would have directly created your expression of your life, and therefore, in my individual activity, I would have directly confirmed and realized my true nature, my human nature, my communal nature. Through work, therefore, you confirm and realize your true nature, and this can be felt in many ways. Some jobs can absolutely make you feel that way. You can even do these things without being paid, through voluntary work, for example, or by making videos on YouTube for people to enjoy. However, Marx says when there's private property, i.e. capitalism, production or your individual activity can be corrupted. When you work for someone else, when you take their orders, when you comply to company policy, your production isn't an expression of your life or your individuality. When what you do is devoid of any individuality, when you're replaceable, when you're just, as people say, a cog in a machine, then your work doesn't confirm and realize your true nature. The classic example is that of the opposition between a factory worker and a carpenter. A carpenter making her own chair works on it, puts her individuality in it, makes it a manifestation of her life. With enough work and passion, she could recognize her chair out of any other chair because that chair became an extension of herself. However, the factory worker who screws 324 identical chair legs in 81 identical chairs in one day does not manifest their individuality whatsoever. If they resign their position, it won't impact the world whatsoever. Their individuality, their personhood, is of no importance in the production chain. This alienates a worker. All of this to say, the movie Taxi Driver isn't randomly titled Taxi Driver. It's titled this way because Bickle's sense of purposelessness, the driving force behind the movie, comes from the fact that he's a taxi driver, someone who is but a mere tool for people to go from point A to point B, someone who can't put any individuality in his work, especially since he doesn't even own the cab he drives. Someone who takes orders from his clients, from his bosses, someone for whom, to his clients and his bosses, is nobody, is a nobody. Bickle knows that. He's nobody. So, what are your options if you're Travis Bickle, a New York taxi driver who has little to no interests or passions, little to no education? What do you do about the fact that you can't find a purpose? Well, as I said earlier, you can either abandon and become complacent or, as alienated workers should do, revolt. Bickle is not convinced by wizard speech and decides to revolt. However, there is no goal to his revolt. It's an aimless revolt. This revolt gives Bickle purpose. Even though it's aimless, even if he doesn't have a goal in mind, he feels like he can do something. He can have an impact. What will that impact do? What will it bring? Shooting a politician? Shooting up a brothel? He doesn't care as long as it affirms his individuality. And what is purpose if not that? An affirmation of who you are. The process through which you exist. And what enables this revolt and its impact? The answer is power. Symbolized by the guns, power is what allows Bickle to affirm his existence, to have an interaction with the world that actually matters. As a nobody, a taxi driver, an alienated worker, Bickle had no power. He was a replaceable cog, someone whose individuality was completely stripped from him. With power, however, he reclaims his individuality. His outburst of violence is a way to break through his powerlessness, break through his alienation, break through his invisibility as a nobody. 
Bickle was never able to affirm his individuality, to confirm his self through the world, so he forced this confirmation through a violent interaction with the world. Every bullet he shoots screams, I'm alive, I'm here, I exist, I can change the world, for better or for worse. On every street, in every city, there's a nobody who dreams of being a somebody. He's a lonely, forgotten man, desperate to prove that he's alive. Bickle wasn't born a nobody. Nobody is born a nobody. People are turned into nobodies through the erasure of their personality, through the erasure of their identity, through the erasure of their self when they sell their energy, time, and bodies to a boss. When you go to work, eight hours a day, five days a week, if not more, when you obey your boss, wear the clothes they want you to wear, use the words they want you to use, smile when they tell you to smile, you are not yourself, you are not free. When the product you make or the service you give is not yours, when it's not a reflection of your personality, when you work solely so you don't starve or get evicted, when your work's sole purpose is to make a profit for your boss, your main interaction with the world, your work, is not a confirmation of your identity, but a denial of it. Thank you so much for watching. I know I'm quite a bit late on the taxi driver analysis video. I watched it uh, with my partner not long ago on Netflix and I really enjoyed it as you probably can see from my analysis of the movie. I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed making it. And as always, I'd like to thank you, Design All Right, and every other patron for supporting the channel. If you also want to support the channel, check out patreon.com forward slash the canvas.